Well, to start the story, I guess you'd have to begin probably with part of my own life as to where I was at the time in, uh, in order to get the story started. Well, I was doing some contracting, and I had a fellow working for me by the name of Jack Torney. And he took care of, we were building a breakwater at Denton's Point at Georgetown Lake and doing some work up there, and we'd also drilled a couple of wells up there. And uh, I had a crew of about six men working up there, and he was overseeing that job. And I was going to Butte and working east of Anaconda. I had three drills, wa water well drills working. So I'd take care of the water well drills and get the men started there. And Jack would go on up the lake and get their job started there. Then I'd go on up the lake and join him. In the meantime, why, uh, this one particular day, why I'd gone to Butte and taken care of the drills and got them going. It was coming back and it was about, oh, about at 10 o'clock, I'd say, in the day. And I stopped by Jack's house to see if he'd got out. He had a little problem getting up in the morning because we usually got up at 4 o'clock to go to work. But uh, he had a little problem getting up in the morning, so I stopped by to see, see if he made it all right on time, and his wife was there. And she says, yeah, but, yeah, Jack got out on time this morning, she says. I said, well, good. Then I don't have to worry about the job of the lake. At least it's gone. She says, yeah, come on in and have some coffee. I want you to meet somebody. I said, well, sure. So I went in, and she introduced me to this cute little red-headed gal, a real pretty little gal. And uh, she introduced it as Jack's sister. In the meantime, she had a ba there was a baby there, about two and a half years old, running around. And during the time we were drinking the coffee, he kept coming up to the table between Ramona and myself and uh, kept pulling at Ma Ramona's apron strings and saying something to him. And I wasn't paying any attention to what was going on or what he was saying. You couldn't hardly understand him. He was just learning to talk. And, uh, well, that's about all that happened anyway. I finished the coffee, and I bid him adieu and headed for the lake to join Jack. Well, I went up the lake, I joined Jack, we finished our day's work. About 8 o'clock that evening, we were coming in, and I, Jack rode in with me, and we dropped, dropped him off at his house, and I went on home, east of Anaconda. Well, I get home, and about 10 o'clock, I'm getting ready to go to bed. got my phone calls all cut up, and the day's getting caught up a little bit. I'm ready to go to bed. Why well, not come on the door. Well, I went to the door, here's Jack and his wife. I told him, I said, what the hell are you doing here at this hour? You know, 4 o'clock comes early, Jack. Oh, i got to talk to you. He says, I had to come out. He said, well, come on in. So they came in, and we had a cup of coffee, sit down to have a cup of coffee. And I said, well, what did you want to talk to me about? Well, he says, you know, when you were at the house and met my sister there, he says, did you hear what her little boy was saying to, to Ramona, my wife? And I thought for a second, no, Jack, I wouldn't pay any attention to him. Well, he kept talking in between you and her there, kept coming up saying something. I said, yeah, I realized that at the time, but I, I wouldn't pay any attention to the baby. He says, he says, well, he says, he was saying that he took a ride in a flying saucer. In the meantime, I said, what? He says, he was telling my wife that he took a ride in a flying saucer. And she said, well, leave me tell him, Jack. So she took over. And she says, he kept say, repeating to me, he took a ride in a flying saucer. She says, and right after you'd left, he says, I jumped on his mother and said, what the hell is he saying? He took a ride in a flying saucer. She says, it's true. He did. She says, well, what do you mean? How did it happen? So then she proceeded to tell me that, uh, that is Jack's wife said that the girl, Jack's sister, proceeded to tell her that she'd been working in West Yellowstone as a waitress. And there was a guy came in there and used to sit at the end stool there at the waitress counter all the time, or at the restaurant counter. And uh, he'd sit there and drink coffee. And uh, after he'd get off work, why, he asked her a couple times if he could walk her home. She wouldn't let him the first time. Second time, she says, oh, why not? He said, well, good, let's, let's go get a beer first. So she wanted to have a beer before she went home. So he's all right. So they went, and they both drank a beer. Johnny had drink a beer, the guy that was with her. But anyway, they had a beer on the way home. He walked her home, oh, several times. It went on for, oh, maybe three weeks or so. And finally, by gosh, she was going home one night. He says, uh, what would you think if I told you that uh, I believe I love you and wanted to marry you? And she says, uh, oh, I don't know. He says, I don't love you but I'm so sick of paying babysitters and trying to work and make it that I'd probably marry her just for a meal ticket. And, uh, and he says, well, he says, I believe, I believe you'd learn to love me, though, because I'd treat you right. And that was all that was said for short ways as they walked toward her home where she was staying. Pretty soon he said, we started talking again. He said, well, there's something I'd have to tell you, though, before we could ever consider getting married or anything or being together, and that is that what would you think if I had told you I was from someplace else? And she says, what the hell is the difference? I don't care if you're from Africa, Asia, or where you're from. That wouldn't make no difference. No, he says, you don't understand. 
He says, what would you think if I told you I was from another world? And she laughed, and she says, what the hell do you do? You think you're the man in the moon or something? The beer was getting to her. They'd had a couple of beers, and she was feeling a little giddy over it. In the meantime, she laughed at him, and he walked off, walked away from her. And she didn't see him again, didn't see him again for several weeks. Now, all of a sudden, one night, she looks over there, and here he is sitting on the end stool again. So she went over and says, where have you been, John? Oh, he says, around. He says, can I walk you home tonight? She said, sure. So after she got off shift, he's walking her home. And it's 2 o'clock in the morning. In the meantime, why, he says, to, to pursue the subject we were on before about me marrying you, he says, there's something I have to let you know. And to let you know this, uh, I've had a hard time trying to figure out how I could tell you. And I feel the only way I could really tell you is if I could talk you into going with me and to meet some of our people, my people, and to go, go for a ride on one of our ships. This is the only way I have of, of making you understand what I have to tell you. Could you do that? She says, well, yeah, I guess I would. She said, what, uh, how long will we be gone? Oh, he says, we'll be back tomorrow. Oh, no, she said, that's out. I can't do that. I got a babysitter home with my baby. I can't do that. No, he says, we'll go home and get the baby and take him with us. And she says, uh, well, yeah, I guess that's all right. So that's what they did. In the meantime, why, uh, they took and got in the car, and they'd left West Yellowstone, and they drove. She said she was watching her speedometer, and it was 105 miles that they'd gone on the speedometer. And they pulled over beyond Twin Bridges at a little place, and he drove up to a country road, just, uh, just a trail, like a logging trailer, where you pull off for a little bit into the trees and stop the car. And she, he says, uh, well, uh, he, first of all, he got out. And he went to the back of the car and got in a trunk. And he got something out of the trunk. She says she didn't know what it was, but she says it was awful dark that night, but the car door was open and the light inside of the car gave him a little light. And she says he walked back up to the door, car door and he says, I'll only be a minute. And he seemed to take and put this thing to his mouth, but she says it looked like something about the size of a box of wooden matches. And she seemed to make sounds into it, she says, but it didn't sound like talking. It was something different entirely. And she, then he went back and put it back in the trunk of the car and come around. He says, now, come on. And she says, I slid over and got out the driver's side and took the baby with me, handed him the baby, and we got out. He said, now, take the baby and stay in front of me. Now, we're going to walk down this trail, and it's dark. And he says, I'm going to close the car door, and we'll wait a second until her eyes get somewhat accustomed to the dark. So he closed the door, and it was so black, she says, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. But she says, she told me to keep the baby in front of me and to walk up this trail. And she says, we just went just a very short ways, and it started to get lighter. And she says, the further you went, the more it lightened up. She said, I don't think we went maybe 100 feet altogether at the most. It would get getting lighter and lighter all the time from when we'd first started. And she said, finally, there on a certain place in the trees there, there was an empty place, a hollow place. And uh, there was a light, a square hole, and a light coming from this square hole. And he told me, he says, stay in front of me and don't move from side to side to get in the, off the, out of the rays of light coming from the hatchway. He says, because you could be severely burnt if you did. So she says, he says, besides, keep the baby in front of you. So she says, I started toward the ship. She said, I couldn't even breathe. She thought she said, I was scared to death. And she says, uh, as we approached the ship, when we got right up close, she said, I looked up and here's a blonde-headed girl holding her hand out. She says, I was never so glad to see somebody in my life. And so she says, I took her hand, and we got on what he called, went up the hatchway and got into the ship. And she said there was no sound, just a little whirring sound like. But she says the hatchway did close. And she says there was no feeling of any kind, no motion of any kind. And next thing she says, he told me, he says, come here, come here and look. And I went over to him, she says, and you could look down through a banana-shaped window, kind of on the floor. I assume that, that uh, to that she meant a concave shape, but she'd call it a banana-shaped window. In the meantime, he says, that's the earth, she says, and you can see this blue ball. He says, we're 250 miles above the earth, and you can see this blue ball spinning. And he said, this is, that is the earth. And uh, that's, all, that's all that was said uh, uh, at that time about the earth. But uh, they returned and went back to West Yellowstone. Uh, in the meantime, uh, she had gotten drunk when she got back to West Yellowstone. And she got drunk for three or four days. 
In the meantime, Johnny got all fed up with her and mad at her about drinking too much, and so he disappeared again. In the meantime, she'd come over to Ramona's and Jack to get away from the too much beer and the whole bit and to recuperate a little bit, and she was visiting with, with her brother and his, his wife. And that's how I encountered her at Jack's house, and that's where it all began. In talking with Jack and his wife and mentioning his sister, I asked him, where is your sister now? Is she at, the, at your house? He says, no, she's gone home. And she's gone home? Yeah, he says, I didn't even get to talk to her. She's gone before I got home from work. He said, boy, and I know my sister. I said, well, you should. You lived with her. I said, well, what do you think, Jack? He said, no, i got to talk to my sister. I said, well, that's the way I feel about it. Let's go. He says, you mean go over now to Twin Bridges? She went back to Twin Bridges. I said, yep, why not? So we went out, got in the truck, and we took off for Twin Bridges, and Jack's wife went home. In the meantime, we get over there in the wee hours of the morning at this ranch house. We go in, and she's in, uh, in the meantime, he had to wake her up. She was sleeping. She'd come out in the robe and sit down at the table there, and we sit there with her. And Jack was asking her about this, and she told Jack literally the same story that, Jack, that Jack's wife had heard from her. In the meantime, why, uh, in talking with her there, well, I told Jack, I said, well, Jack, what's the possibility of getting him to come back, being that he's left, he's gone somewhere? Do, do, does she have, do you have contact? I asked his sister. And she says, oh, yeah, she says, he's been a student at the University of Southern California. In the meantime, we can, I can write him a letter. I said, well, good. Tell you what, why don't you write a, a letter to him Ask, telling him that you've got to see him right away. It's very important. And don't tell him no more than that. And tell him that, uh, and mail it, air mail, special delivery. And the sooner you get it in the mail, the better. She said, yeah, I'd do that. So Jack and I took off for home on that letter. In the meantime, why, she had written the letter and mailed it at noon in Twin, in Twin Bridges. In the meantime, uh, we told her to call us if she'd heard from him after she wrote the letter. Well, the next day at 7 o'clock in the evening, she calls. She says, he's here. Jack called me. She says, my sister called. She says, he's there. I said, that's impossible, Jack. If you stop and think about it, she had to write the letter. Just enough time for her to get to California. No time for him to get up here. If, well, what with luck that it to be, be in California and delivered in, in, in that quick. He says, yeah, I know. He says, but she says he's there. And if she says he's there, he's there. I said, all right, let's go. So we took off for Twin Bridges. Well, we were just uh, getting late in the day at, at that time. And in the meantime, why, we get over to Twin Bridges, and he was there. He was sitting at the table. And to make it better yet, the letter was sitting on the table. And I swung it around and looked at it, and it was marked out. It was post thing that had the lines through it, where it had been had gone airmailed to California in that much time. So in the meantime, why, I was a little eggshelled from there on. I was afraid that I might say something or do something to scare the guy off. And yet the guy who just seemed to be a normal guy didn't make any difference than we were. And we talked there with him for a while. And uh, he asked us a lot about our, our business that we're in and always said, well, you seem to be interested in it. Well, he says, I'm always interested in equipment and all. So I piped up and said, well, listen, if you can get away sometime, why don't you come on over? You can stay at my place. i got an extra bed and bedroom. You're welcome to. And hell, you can go to work with me. You'll see what goes on. God, he says, you know, I find that very entertaining, very enjoyable. He says, I'm out of school now. He says, I don't have to go back till later. I've got a, I've got, I've got a few months. i got my whole summer vacation. I said, well, fine. Why don't you come on and go over with it? He said, you know, i got to think I will. And so he did. He jumped in his car and followed us all the way over. And he came to my house, and he stayed at my house that night. Well, from there on, he stayed for two and a half months, but sometimes Johnny would disappear for two or three days at a time. And no explanations or nothing. But most of the time, when he was there, he'd go to work with me all day long. I'd talk with him in the morning before we went to work. I'd talk with him all day long when we were at work and driving back and forth between the jobs. And I'd get talk with him in the evenings. And uh, I was trying to ask him questions, any question I could think of to get all the information out of him I could. But at the same time, the first thing I had to do before I could do this was to break him down and get him to talk without scaring him off where he'd run away. So the first thing we'd done, I had to go to, uh, I had ordered a truckload of casing with another driller by the name of Bob Hudson. 
In the meantime, why, they'd made a mistake and dumped the whole load at Bob Hudson's place, which was over uh, at Melrose. And uh, I had to go over and pick up my half and truck it back home myself. I had a little semi that just pulled by, by a pickup, but it, it would handle 12,000 pounds, so I went over and was going to take it over and load it. So I told John, we'll hook onto that trailer and get it ready to go, and we'll leave in the morning. We'll go over and, and pick up that load of pipe. So that's what we did. We went over and picked up the pipe. All the way over, I tried to break him down and think of a way to break him down. It went on and on and on. In the meantime, oh, I got ahead of myself a little there. I'm going to have to backtrack. And that is, uh, he was there at the house for a partner two weeks before I went after the pipe. And I tried a dozen different ways to you know, find a loophole or some way to get to him without scaring him off. And I couldn't find nothing. There's no way I could get, get into the right subject or, or get him to talk or lead him into anything that would give me a reason to, uh, to question him or anything honestly. And I didn't want to scare him off. It was too much to do. And he was different than we are. Not much, but a little bit. But anyway, finally when this uh, truck loaded casing, we went out to get it, he went with me. And uh, when we were coming back, it's after dark at night, it was 10 1030 at night, 11 o'clock, and we got right on top of the big hole divide. Then it had been a long day, and I told John, hell, I'm going to stop here and relieve myself. So he said, yeah, it's a good idea. So we stopped and got out and relieved ourselves. I mean, that was a beautiful moonlight light, night, light, night. And the, uh, if you could look to the west, and there was a mountain range there, where you could see the valley of the Big Hole Valley on one side and the uh, Deer Lodge Valley or the Anaconda Valley on the other side, which was about 20 miles across there. Also, you could see 20 miles back up on the range to the peaks. So it was about a 20 mile square area. But in the meantime, why I got tired of uh, uh, being uh, trying to find some way to break John out, uh, down on this so I could talk to him, I scared him off. So I thought, well, I'm just going to take the bull by the horns. I'm going to blow it if I have to blow it. I said, John, I said, you know, I, I've spent a couple of weeks now trying to find a loop or a way to get to you without scaring you off. And I was honest with him you know, all. And uh, I can't do it, John, so I'm going to have to take a gamble on it. I hope you don't run. I said, what would you think if I told you I had suspicions of who you were, where you were from and such? And I want to ask you questions. I want to know a lot about you, your life, your people's life, everything you can tell me. Would you answer the questions or are you going to run? He didn't say anything. We got in the truck started down the hill. I said, well, John, how about it? You're going to, you're going to talk to me and, and answer my questions or are you going to run? Well, he says, Russ, he says, you know, he says, you're, you're a different person, he says. You're probably the most honest person I've ever known. Uh, he says, also, he says, you're, you're a good person. I like you and I don't want to hurt you. And anything I would tell you or any answer I'd give you, you relate it to somebody else, they're going to ridicule you and I'd be hurting you by telling you. So no, he said, I don't want to answer your questions. I don't want to hurt you. And I told him, I said, well, John, I said, that's my business. You leave me worry about being hurt. I said, I'm pretty hard shelled. And I don't think anybody can hurt me from it with anything I might tell them, nor anything that you tell me can hurt me in any way. It can only help me as far as I'm concerned. And this I want to know. And I want to be able to ask you questions. I want you to ask them. And as long as you answer me honestly, that's all I ask. Well, how about it, John? Well, yeah, he said, why not? Well, I said, you see, I put on the brakes and slowed it down. It took a little ways. We stopped. As you see that mountain range up there, meantime, I was in low gear anyway going down the hill. We were barely moving. It was awful steep grade. As you see that mountain range up there, this is the first thing come in my mind to ask him. Yeah? He says, yeah. I said, well, it's 20 miles back to those peaks about, and it's 20 miles across there, and that's all on bedrock. If your people wanted to farm that land, how long would it take them to prepare it and level it and also it could be farmed? And he looked at me, he said, oh, and they looked at the range. He said, I don't know. He says, I think they could do it in 30 days if they didn't extract the minerals. So in the meantime, why I got thinking about this in the next few seconds and it just boggled my mind. What kind of equipment would they have that could tear that mountain range 20 miles in 30 days like that. Uh, what kind of tonnage would they have to move? Just multiple hundreds of tons. So I asked John, I said, John, what kind of bulldozers, what kind of equipment do you have that will move such masses as this? Oh, no, he says, that, that isn't the way our people would do it at all. I said, well, how the hell would they do it? Well, he says, we'd bring in one of our motherships and bring it in close to the surface. 
and the mothership could reach into the earth a certain depth, a given depth, 100 feet, whatever you wanted. And they could pick that up and pulverize it completely and lay it down to where it would spread like or unlike water to be pulverized so fine. Then they come back and reach in and get another big bite. They can do anything they want with it. And this only takes minutes. And it's all done electronically. I thought, oh my God. So in the meantime, in my own mind, I thought, what kind of a ship? How big would the ship have to be? So I asked John, I said, John, how big are these motherships that you mentioned? And he looked kind of dumbfounded, and he thought for a minute. He says, I can't tell you. I said, what the hell do you mean you can't tell me? What is it, a military secret or something? No, no. He said, no, I, can, I can't tell you. I said, oh, you ought to have some idea if they're 100 or 200 or 1,000 feet across them or how big they are. He thought again for a minute. He said, no. He said, there's no way. I can't tell you. He said, they're assembled in outer space. They've never been near anything. I don't have no comparison. In the meantime, why, well, I, I could understand that, so I accepted it as an explanation. But now, if I go ahead in the story, four years later, why, a uh, party I had contacted me, a woman by the name of Lenore Croft, and her, and her husband or boyfriend, or whatever he was, uh, Major Aho out of Seattle, Washington. And uh, they had come to me and asked to hear the story. I told them the story. Uh, this was, uh, oh, about Mm, about uh, two years after this incident with John. And then it was another three years, I believe, after that, I got a phone call from her, and she said, Bus, this is Lenore Croft. I said, yes, how you been? She says, oh, good. She says, but I had to call you. I got a letter from a friend of mine in Mount Palomar, California. He's a scientist. She mentions his name, which I didn't even pay any attention to. And she says, he writes in this letter, this is what he writes me. I knew you'd be interested in this. And in the letter he'd written her where they had photographed a ship in outer space. And his estimations, they guessed it to be approximately 10,000 miles from the Earth. And the measurements of the ship across the berth of the ship was approximately 15 miles. <laughs> so uh, this added in, into what, why John couldn't tell me the size of the ship. He says that they, his planet does not revolve. They have two moons, but the planet does not revolve. They live on a perimeter between the hot and cold side on his planet. And uh, he said it was about 250 miles wide. It circled the entire planet. The planet is much smaller than the planet Earth. He said they had 47 million people. This was their entire population. They believe in birth control because of the lack of water, mainly, which is their reason that they are here on Earth. They're here on Earth because they, their planet is dying because they do not have water. And they have confiscated a certain amount of water from Earth and taken it back there to survive. However, they feel it's their problem. So if they're going to live with Earth's people, it's their problem to learn to live with Earth's people. And that's why they're here. However, they do not have any intentions of living on Earth. They believe that they will inhabit the planet Mars and that Earth also will be allowed to inhabit the planet Mars in the future, and that they will furnish the transportation, if necessary, to go there for anybody from any walk of life from Earth, if they wish to go, can go. But you can take nothing with you, and you will live under their ways of life and ways of government. Uh, their ways of life and their ways of government is not bad. John and I, in talking, they have a different calculation in time than us. But in John and I, when we talked, we tried to break down and figure out how many hours a week, a month, a year you'd work and all, and how old you'd be when you retired. And according to, Earth, uh, they, according to John's and my calculations on it, you work 12 hours a week. That's all you work. That's all that's required of you to make a living. And yet everything in life is furnished for that 12 hours a week. And you retire at an age of 42. Yet their span of life is 92 years. They are also much smaller people than we are. Uh, to see a couple uh, slightly above or around three feet in height is not out of the ordinary on their planet. But to see a man six foot is out of the ordinary. They, they, they don't have large people. They are rather small people. I even asked John as to why he figured that they would be small. He said, just the way that we've evolved because of our lifestyles and the difference in the way that you have evolved and become larger people. And, the, and when I got into that with him, I thought back from when I was back east and went on the Mayflower. And I can't even stand up in the Mayflower below decks. 
The ceilings are too low for me because I'm six foot tall. All the people were small at that time, yet they have evolved. The people of this country and the world have evolved. They are now are still becoming larger people. So it, it makes sense to me anyway at that time. Uh, I asked John if they, if they married on his planet. He says, yes, definitely. I says, at what age? He's oh, probably the same age as you do here. He says, about 18 years old, 16, 18, something like that, right in their clothes. I asked him, well, uh, what do you have for marriage ceremony? Do you have to get marriage license? He says, you do have to go down and be registered. There's records that are kept of you being married. And you do go down and sign up, so to speak. And then you get married. I said, well, what's the marriage ceremony consist of? Well, he says, it's kind of a vague thing. He says, there's usually nobody there, but the man or woman is getting married. I said, well, what happens? He says, well, we've got a place. He says, and I don't know what to call it. I don't know what to call it. It's a big building. He says, Torah, as near as I can figure, might be the word that would, uh, would be something used would call it. And he said, you go in the door, the big main doors in the front, and just as you get inside, there's a silver table. And you walk up to the silver table, and there's a vase right in the middle of the table. And on each side of the vase is a little... Uh, platter-like, and there, it's made, usually made of metal, of silver, and he says the, this vase in the middle has a powder in it, and you can take a little bit of that powder and put it on each one of these vases, and it ignites and burns, and gives off uh, a smoke, and you inhale that smoke. When you get through with that, you're, you're all done, you're married. I said, well, what the hell's the smoke got there? He says, I don't know. He says, we've questioned a lot of NASA, and they said that it makes you a little more passionate for a few days. <laughs> So they do marry there at least, and they're allowed to have two children. They believe in birth control. Two children is all you're allowed to bear. Everybody's allowed to bear two children. I asked John if they, uh, if they had any uh, criminal actions on his planet, and he says, no, I don't think so. He says, why would we have criminal action? I said, well, people stealing stuff. He says, well, what would you steal? I told him, I says, well, I don't know. What if a TV, the same as they do here or anything else? Well, no, you automatically get it all. You get all you want for nothing. What do you want to steal it for? All you got to do is take it as yours anyway. So we got into quite a thing on what you get and what you don't get. I asked about groceries. Do you have places to shop? Oh, yeah. He said, we got just like Safeways or any of your big shopping centers or anything here. Same thing there. I said, well, what do you use for money? We don't use money. I said, well, what do you do if you want to get something? He said, you go get it. I says, yeah, what if you go down to a place and you're going to have a steak dinner, you feel great, so you got three steaks, you go home, you only eat one, you only eat a fourth of the vegetables you brought home, you got to throw them out, they're going to spoil. What happens? Well, he says, no main difference, they return to the soil. And by the way, he stopped me on the steak. They do not have steak. They are not meat eaters. They are strictly vegetarian. I asked John also about animals. They had animal life on their planet. Oh, yes, he says, we, we've got several animals. He says, we've got a an animal similar to your house cat. He said, but they're very rare and very few. But he says, we do have a few of them on the planet. I said, how about birds? Oh, he said, well, he says, actually, the turtle dove of Montana, we have a bird very similar to it. And that's the only fowl we have. We have no other birds or fowl on our planet. I said, well, don't you have other animals too? He said, nope. I said, well, how about reptiles? And he said, oh, yeah, he says, we got snakes and reptiles. I said, well, that's interesting. I said, well, uh, what's your reptiles like? He said, well, we've got some big ones. I said, how big? He said, oh, hell, they're big as your whales. I said, what? He, I, he says, they're big as your whales. He says, they're big. I said, you mean they're big as dinosaurs? He said, what's dinosaurs? He wasn't familiar with dinosaurs at all. So I told him, I said, well, John, you tell me your dinosaurs are your things that I believe are dinosaurs are big is our whales. How come you use whales? Well, he says, I don't know about this dinosaur thing. So I went and got a book and looked it up in this world book and showed him. And he said, hell, he said, but I never studied anything about them. He said, but whales, there's no oceans on, or anything on our planet. I'm interested in oceans and water, and I studied about whales. And so that's why I said whales, which I thought was quite interesting. But in the meantime, uh, he said that the reptiles live on the hot side and sometimes on the cold side, but they live on the perimeters where it's uh, too hot mostly for humans to exist. The humans stay away from it. Oh, also, they live in a twilight high haze. They don't live in a direct sun. They live in a twilight haze because of the planet not revolving. Oh, I also asked Johnny about radio and how radio worked in outer space. And he says it's just absolute perfection. The 
the distance that you can get out of it and the way it works and all. He says, it really works good in outer space. I also uh, asked him about his own planet and transportation, if they had transportation on the planet, because uh, it was a pretty good-sized planet, and the boundary has to have some way to get around. And he said, oh, yes, he says, we have uh, automobiles like you, not like you have exactly, but they are this type of, of mode of transportation. I said, well, you mean where just a family can get in and go? Oh, yeah, yeah. He says, actually, he says, we have, have it to where if you want to go somewhere on the planet, you can go down and, and get this just like you'd get an automobile. Your family can get into it, and you can travel right along on, on a, like a highway, same as a highway here. And uh, I asked him, I said, well, how fast do they go, Johnny? He says, oh, about 100, 150 miles an hour. I said, 100, 150? Oh, yeah, he says, that's just a normal speed. I says, yeah, but how do you keep out of accidents? Oh, he says, there are no accidents. You can't. He says, they're polarized, and you can't run into nobody. It'll veer off, but you can, there's no way you can run into anybody or anything or get hurt. There's no way. It's just automatic. And he said, besides, if you're in a hurry and really want to go someplace, you can move over to the side of which would be your highway, say, like you have here, and you can latch onto an electronic rail, and you can travel up to 600 miles an hour. And it's all automatically controlled. And it's still the same. It's polarized where you can run into anything. I said, boy, they must have some real tires in order, rubber tires in order to, to get them speeds out of it. Oh, no, no. He says, we don't use rubber. We have no use for rubber on our planet. We find, he says, I can't think of anything they use rubber for on our planet. I said, well, if you don't use rubber for tires, what the hell do you make tires out of? He says, no, steel. He says, we lived in them. Your harder metals, your, more, your, your real good metals. He says, we reduce, we re I said, well, how you reduce your friction? He says, we reduce the friction electronically, which I thought was very interesting. No use for rubber. I asked John about their, their kids in schooling. I asked him, I said, John, if you had a child that was going to sc start school, at what age would they start? Well, I said, we start our children way ahead of them here. He said, we start our, ch our children at the age of two. I said, well, at the age of two, how do they teach them? Well, he says, most generally, it's done during the hours of sleep. I said, well, how do you teach a child to sleep? He says, by playing recordings back to them over and over. And you'd be amazed what their mind will accept. It's unreal what they're able to do. I said, all right, let's say that you've got a child, they're growing up, they're educated, they're ready for college. Now, if they get into college, they go through their college, let's say they get a four years of college. Now we got a child that's gone through four years of college. How old are they on your planet? Well, by the way, your time limit is different than ours, and if we figure it the same as ours, we estimate it to be approximately 13 years old when they finish their college with the same thing that we get in college here, which I thought was quite interesting. I asked him also uh, if they'd done any other thing uh, in uh, mental telegraphy and such as this. He says, yes, that they'd done ex a really tremendous studies in it, and that the, the progress that they made in it, have made in it is unbelievable, that the power of the human mind is really something, and what it has the capability of doing and in contacting from one person to another. He says, actually, they haven't even phased it here, and we haven't phased it, but we have done a lot with it, a lot more than what has been done here, we feel. Uh, they do not smoke on his plant, but he says they probably, and they didn't know about anything about alcohol, drinking alcohol, nor cigarettes, but he says they probably will soon because they've, they've taken it from here and taken it up there, and there's quite a few of them indulge and find, it, find that it is an enjoying thing. So we've probably made alcoholics out of them all by now. <laughs> uh, I asked him, <clears throat> ask him about their clothing. He says they clothe only to the waist. They do not clothe the upper half of their body, males nor females. There's nothing thought of it. It's normal on their planet. Uh, he says also that the temperature is controlled on their planet. As he also says, there'll be a day come when temperatures will be controlled here, uh, as they do on their planet. They have some means of doing it. How? I have no idea. And he didn't either, but he says he knows that they can do it and that it is done, whatever this may mean. I asked him about... Uh, Gold, uh, if gold had a value on his planet, he says, no, not, not really. He says, it does here, I know, but here's the only place it has uh, any meaning at all. Uh, I asked him, uh, well, uh, what is valuable on your planet? He says, water. I said, all right, if I had a gallon of water, uh, 
what could I, well, what would it be worth? Well, he says, that's kind of hard to say, but I'll tell you this, they'd trade you a gallon of gold for it any day and think nothing of it at all. It's far more valuable than a, than a gallon of gold. I asked him if they took pictures and photographs. He says, yes. He says that they have been making tapes and documentaries for 300 years and that our people will be given access to all this in the future whenever this is announced to the people of the world. Uh, the question I did ask John is, uh, if it's going to be announced to the people of the world, how are they going to announce it? He said, well, but this was in 1952 all this happened. He said, well, but he says in 1960, he says there's a letter in the Catholic Church known as the Fatima Letter, which was given to them many, many years ago. And this is announcing our uh, presence on earth and what it's all about. I said, well, what's the Catholic Church doing with it? Well, he says it was given to the Catholic Church because they have the largest amount of followers of an educated mind. I said, oh, hell, Mahatma Gandhi's got more followers than the Catholic Church. No, no, he says, of an educated mind. He says, and that's what was decided, and that's why the, it was given to the Catholic Church. Well, I waited like a vulture and broke my butt to buy a television and put up a 100-foot antenna because we couldn't get a television where I lived, and we finally got television. And I waited for 1960. 1960 came, and what happens? They announced that the Pope is going to read the letter. And when he did, he went into seclusion. And three days later, they had him back on the same program, on the news, and he said, for three days and three nights, I have wept tears, tears of joy. Thank you. And he got off the podium, and that was it. I was never so disappointed in my life. He wouldn't tell him what it was about. And this, this can be checked, because... Uh, whether or not it took place. I'm sure is this documented. But uh, so who knows when they're going to enlighten us and let us know really what's going on or let the people of the world know. I feel I know a lot myself. In fact, I feel sorry for all these other people that don't know. I can't imagine this many people being that much in the dark. Uh, in talking with Johnny, I asked him uh, about how we got here on Earth. Johnny related to me that many, many years ago that a very high later rate of life lived on the planet Mars. But uh, through uh, stupidity, I guess you'd say, they burnt all the oxygen out of the air. And they realized this real early, and they knew that sooner or later they were going to die. And there was no stopping it, nothing could be done about it. In the meantime, they stumbled into the secret of space travel just before the last days of life. And a small handful went into space, searching for a world in which they might live. In the meantime, they came to the closest place they could find, which was Earth. And they colonized Earth. The other people remained on the planet, and they did become extinct. They all died and become extinct. But the people that went to the Earth, they remained on Earth, and yet another small handful left Earth to look for another world to live on to live in. In the meantime, in their search, they had to go a long ways away. And in doing so, they did find another planet. In fact, they found two planets very close together. But uh, they, as the people on Mars, destroyed the secret of, of, uh, of space travel and lost it and fell back and become barbaric because of wars and arguing, men for women, women for men, or what have you. But anyway, they become barbaric, so did the ones on Earth. Then they came forward to be the early Egyptians of Earth. In the meantime, then the people on the other planet came forward and become the people that we know as the Alpha Centaurians, as Johnny's people. And they have had the secret of space travel back 300 years. They've had it for the last 300 years. It was lost many years before that, but it was rediscovered. And now that they had it, why, they realize their planet is dying because of the lack of water. And also the planet next to them is dying. Now the few people that colonated the planet next to theirs are warmongers, yet, and cannot get out of it. And if they had the secret of space travel, they'd destroy Johnny's people. But they don't have it and are not likely to get it because everything they're doing, everything they're trying is putting into wars to fight one another, 
sure they'll never get enough advancement to get space travel at the rate they're going. In the meantime, however, Johnny's people are very glad that it's that way because they'd destroy him if they did. But in the meantime, uh, being that the planet is dying, Johnny's people feel that they have to do something. So they thought, what can we do? Well, they know of a planet that is 41 years of travel from theirs that possibly they have never been there. They say that it's too far an adventure. It takes too many years. But they do believe there is life on it. And they believe it's life as we know it, human life. But they, they didn't want to try to, to go to it and to colonize there. They thought they'd be better off to go another way, which they have figured. And that is to replenish their original planet, Mars, with an atmosphere that will sustain life. It's almost got one now, but not quite, to sustain a large population life. But the Earth is overabundant with atmosphere. And they believe, their scientists, that they can remove anywhere from 2% or 2.5% to 16% of the Earth's atmosphere to the planet Mars to make it inhabitable. And they will do this with the sanction of the people of Earth. And the people of Earth will be allowed to inhabit the planet Mars with them. They will we'll own half of it. It will be half Earth's people and half theirs. And we'll colonize it together. If people so desire, anybody from any walk of life on the face of the Earth, desire to go, they'll be furnished the transportation and they can go. Not only that, you don't have to stay. It takes five days to go to Mars. Five days more, you can come back if you want. Nobody cares. You can come back and forth many times as you want. Because the amount of transportation that's available is unbelievable. Just all, just at, at abundance. In the meantime, uh, that way, they would be able to live on the planet. But it also gives us a way to go. And the way the world is being handled, mainly not the United States to begin with, when this was set up, and they picked the United States as a, as a headquarters, and this was their main place. The United States was the head of their operation because of our Constitution. Although now we're drifting from our Constitution in many, many places. Also, the rest of the world, they couldn't see eye to eye with that, and they realized, and Johnny stated, that Russia would fall. All these would fall, and they all would adapt the United States type of government, and it's happening. And has been for quite some time. They also said that we would would accept birth control, which we have. This is all stuff that's been brought by them. But in living here and them having to live with us and share the planet Mars is something that is coming and it will be in the future and not that far away. Jack Turney had moved a little backhoe we had over to Butte to do a small contract for a sewage system. And he didn't quite finish that that day, and I was busy with some of the other guys and the other work that we had going, moving a couple drills. And so I told, uh, Jack, I told uh, Johnny, I said, Take, jump in your car and run over to Butte and pick up Jack and bring him back and those other two guys he got with him. So Johnny said, sure. So he takes off for Butte to go pick up Jack. <coughs> well, <coughs> the next day, why, I get talking with Jack on the job, and... Uh, Jack tells me that Johnny got pulled over going up Harrison Avenue 80, 87 miles an hour. And the patrolman pulled him over. And he got out and, and uh, went back to the patrol car and then went over and got uh, unlocked the back of his car, uh, Johnny's trunk on his car, and got into something, box or something back there and got some papers and took them back. And he showed them to the patrolman. He looked at several pages and then took one page of them and kept it. And all but saluted Johnny and says, fine, you're on your way. That's it. John got back in and we took off for Anaconda. And so I asked Johnny about it. I said, Johnny, what the hell was these papers you showed? Uh, it's a patrolman over there. Oh, he says that. He says, well, it's really nothing. He says, we've been providing. He says, most of our people that have to work directly with the public, and all, we've been provided with papers to protect us for such things as this. Uh, we can't be arrested. We can only be arrested and turned over to our own people. That's the only thing they can do. But they could never incarcerate us in any way. And he says, so I just went and got my trunk and got a copy of the, one of these papers that I've got that our, your government has given us. And it exonerates us from anything like this. They can't touch us. And so the patrolman uh, took it, took a copy of it, and he also read it, and he took a copy for himself of it. And that was it. He said, threw me a highball, and I was free. Well, they very much know are aware of this and have been for years that it's existing. 
Well, they feel we're just not ready to, to handle it at all. They feel that, uh, that it's just too much for the, for the people of this world to handle. And then mainly, I believe, because it, it does. It, it puts down all the religions. And, and, uh, and people that have been taught for generations, uh, you know, have taught a religion of a type or anything, it's awful hard to wean them from it and tell them, no, oh, that was all hogwash. No, this is the way it really is. And I think this is what they're afraid of, and they just don't want to announce to people to start a, an uproar like this. Uh, they don't have. They have no religion. Johnny did say one thing at one time. I asked him, I can't believe that, John. There's got to be something somewhere. And he says, well, he says, all I can tell you is someday in the future, the people of Earth are going to be ready, and when they are, they will be given into detail exactly what we believe and how we believe. Now, what that meant, I could never get out of it. I said, well, what do you mean by that, John? And he says, you aren't ready yet. So what that means, I don't know. At one time, I was going to take a contract for the Anaconda Company, and I needed to purchase a drag line. And all I lacked to do in the contract was $15,000 to put down as the down payment on that drag line. The contract would pay it out. But I'd, be, I'd still be short of paying the 15000 But it would pay the balance of it out in full. The drag line was 33000 But anyway, uh, I figured the contract and got all the figures out and everything. And John was with me all the time. In the meantime, John says, oh, I think you ought to do the contract. I said, no, I can't, John, because I can't, I can't raise the money and see you on an honest way to pay it back for the 15000 Oh, I still think you ought to do the contract. I said, no, hell, that's out. Forget it. I'm not going to do it. So he stretched a little bit. He said, well, he says, I'm going to take a ride for a while. He went, went out and got in his car and left. He said, this is in the evening. At the end of the day, the sun was going down. In the meantime, why, that's all I heard of John for then. Next morning, I had three or four of the guys in the house having coffee. They were just getting ready to go to work real early in the morning. Here, knock comes at the door. Come on in, John. Here, who walks in but John? And he'd done the same thing he'd done the other time, before, one time before. He walked in, he went right back out again. I thought, hell, there's no smoked fish in here. So I went out to see what was wrong. He says, well, look. And he showed me his hands. And his hands were just completely green, the most beautiful green you've ever seen. He said, I can't go in there. Those guys are going to ask me questions. And I don't want them needling me or bugging me this because I can't tell them anything. I don't want to tell them anything. He said, do you have any of those little cloth gloves that you give the guys for work? Well, I had these little ca canvas gloves, and I bought them by the case. Sure, so I went in and I got a pair of them and gave them to John. And he put them on. They comes in, he sits down at the table. Here he is, sitting at the other, with the other guys drinking coffee, and they're looking at him with the gloves on, drinking coffee. <laughs> None of them would ask him a question, though. <laughs> but anyway, after they all left, why? Then I asked John about this green stuff. I said, John, I said, what in the hell is the green stuff on your hands? Well, he says, you see them dark things underneath you can see dark blotches like and you could you can see them underneath on the back of one hand in particular he says actually he says we had trouble with the ship last night he says if i would take this off wash this off now i would become radioactive burnt he says in having trouble with the ship we're able to put this on and we can work right with radioactive material with our bare hands it has no effect on us as long as we leave it on 48 hours or 24 hours rather as long as we leave it on 24 hours and then I can wash it off, and I won't become burnt. So that's all that was said. So in the meantime, he told me about the trouble. He also told me it was the first time he had ever manipulated or run a ship itself. Well, uh, the next day, the next evening, in fact, John says, uh, hey, he says, I'm going to wash that stuff off. I said, good. I said, go on over and wash it off the kitchen sink. So he went over to the kitchen sink. I walked over with him, and he washed, he washed. Soap, nothing. It wouldn't move. No colorment in the soap, no colorment in the water, nothing. He says, it don't come off easy. He says, does your wife have any oil? She says, yeah, I've got Mazola. So she went over to the refrigerator and got this thing of Mazola out of the refrigerator. He said, pour some of my hands. He cupped his hands. She poured some on, and it all came off immediately down the sink drain. So in the meantime, I asked John, I says, uh, listen, where does that stuff come from, John? He says, hell, it's a mineral. He says, and there's all kinds of it here on the earth. He says, it's all over, even in Montana here. It's readily available. He says, if they just knew that, just think what they could do. Instead of using them tongs to mix radioactive material and all they could do with their bare hands. He says, God, somebody's going to find it one of these days and they're going to make a fortune. Well, that's all that was said on that particular subject at that time. But quite a while later, John disappeared for three or four days and was gone. He came back and he said, 
hey, I got something for you. And what? He reached in his shirt pocket. He pulled it out. I held out my hand. He dropped in. It's a little piece of rock with that green stuff on it. He says, there, he says, that's the green stuff. He says, find out what it is. Make yourself some money. In the meantime, I had a friend that was going to FBI school. And I'd known him when he was a kid, and I knew we knew each other when we grew up. And he decided he wanted to be an FBI agent. And he happened to drop in that next day and visit with me. He said he was going back to FBI school. And I told him about Johnny Marshall, and I told him about this rock I had. He said, why the hell did you give me the rock, and I'll get it analyzed. We'll find out what it is, and I'll be back in touch with you. I've never seen the guy again. Never. Never found no sign of him. His father died a year later. His father had never heard from him anymore. Nothing. I don't know what happened. I have no idea yet. Nor what happened to that rock, but I wish I had it. <laughs> A hundred times since then. When Johnny had come in and, and uh, gotten the gloves from me that one morning, when he had the green stuff on his hands, why, after he got the gloves on, he digs around in his shirt pocket, and he pulls out this check. It was a bank draft. Bank draft for $15,000 on a Denver bank. And he handed it to, to me on the table. He said, there, go get your drag line. I looked at him and says, what the hell did you do, rob a bank or something? He says, no. He says, I got a friend in the trucking business in Denver. And uh, he told me how he served in the service with this young fella, and uh, that when they got out of service, they opened this trucking firm. And Johnny don't have to worry about money or work, so he didn't do anything. But the guy still claimed that Johnny was half his partner because he had half the money going in. And so he says, I never asked him for any at any time or done anything. So I thought, hey, you need the money. I'll go down and get 15000 for you. So he says, I went down in the middle of the night, looked the guy up. The guy's well enough known that he could call the local banker there. And the banker unlocked that bank in the middle of the night and had a, punched out a bank draft for him for 15000 And that's where I got it. He says, it's perfectly legal, so go get your drag line. And I told him, no, I still can't do that. I, 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 I can't see my way clear to pay it back. You don't have to pay it back. I said, no, not in my book. I won't do that. So I forced him to take the bank draft. He put it back in his shirt pocket and was there the rest of that morning and clear into the afternoon when he left. And the day after that, he'd bought in a ring in a jeweler store in Anaconda for $15,000, a diamond ring, beautiful big ring. In the meantime, three or four days after that, him and Jack had been stopping in, going and coming here and there, drinking beer and all with the boys in a bit. And he gave some guy, said, boy, I'd sure like to have that. George says, that's fine, keep it. He gave it to him. And later when I talked to Johnny and asked Johnny, I said, who was the guy you give that to? He said, I don't know. He was a hell of a nice guy, though. And he gave him the $15,000. Then I was sorry I didn't take the check. <laughs> in, in talking with Johnny, uh, when we were talking before about a gallon of water and a gallon of gold, that the water was more valuable than the gold, one gallon of water, according to Johnny, these small reconnaissance ships that we see that are up to about 200 feet across them, will suspend one, of, one gallon of water will suspend one of those ships in the air and in space at the speeds they travel and all for about two weeks' time. Johnny says, I told Johnny, what happens to the water then? He says, well, during that period of time, it's always reclaimed and reused. But after we get through two weeks' time, we wear it out. It's worn out. There's nothing else, nothing left to reclaim. So we have to replenish the fuel. But the fuel that runs those ships is water. Nothing but plain water. And they run an electronic, electrical, and a gravitational motor. The ships will travel between six and seven miles a second in our atmosphere. These are small reconnaissance ships that we see. And Johnny says they vary in size anywhere from 10 to 15 feet across them to 200 feet across them. And some of them are two and 300 years old, still operating, still running, no problems. They also, uh, their guidance system is uh, they're guided by a radonic signal, which they can, uh, like if they wanted to go to the moon, they'd throw out a radonic signal that would reach the moon. They'd latch onto that signal and follow that signal to the moon. No guiding necessary or nothing. It's just automatic. Does. Wherever they want to go, they throw out a radonic signal and then follow it. Also in travel, the ship generates an, an, uh, an ionosphere on the outside of the ship. The size of the ship uh, depend, uh, determines the thickness of the ionosphere. When they're traveling through space at high speeds, the ionosphere wears off, but it is regenerated as fast as it wears off. And a small reconnaissance ship, like if you had a reconnaissance ship of 200 feet across it, 
it would probably have an ionosphere of 50 feet around it, 60 feet thick, some, 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 something in this category. But yet it would never vary. It would wear off and replace itself as fast as it wears off. Also, you could dive it into the mountain or dive it into the ocean, and it will not penetrate the water. It will bounce off of it. But they, like people say, they had seen them diving in the ocean. I really don't believe that myself, because John told me that they won't do it. They'll bounce off of it. They will not penetrate and go beneath the water. Now, with all these stories that you hear on TV, with all these abductions and everything, and the people's all scared to death and been scared to death and they're all rattled up, I just can't, I, I can't imagine such a thing. I, I don't know whether it's the people or what it is, but I don't go along with any of it because what I find with this is, I think this is the funniest thing that's ever happened to the Earth. It really is. It's, it's probably, probably it could be the only salvation for the Earth and, and the people on it. And uh, I just don't know where they get all this fear at all from it. It's nothing to fear. It's something to feel real good about. Because it is real, and it's, and it's, and it's a very factual, and it's very honest, and it's very human, the same as we are, very much so. But the only difference is it's completely honest. That's the only difference between them and the people of this world, I believe. But it is good. It is very good. And the sooner it makes contact, the sooner the people are enlightened as to what is really going on, the better I'll feel about it, the world, and everything. And I'm sure everybody will feel no different than I.